scientific, real science, real fun. Hello, my name's Mr. Q and welcome to 8th grade science. I've been studying your curriculum and this is a pretty awesome year. 8th grade you get some really cool stuff to study in science, but I'm a science nerd so that's me. It's my thing, so. But, as I was looking through it and, you know, trying to put it in a logical order, this seemed the right place to start. You know, anything, you start small, so we're going to start with a very small, very narrowly focused topic called the entire universe. Yeah, we really are going to start with the entire universe. There is a concept that applies to the whole universe that really is going to be the building block of everything you learn, at least for the first two-thirds of the year. We'll get to life science later, but all your physical science, all your earth science, the one thing that comes right down to the core of it is gravity. And there's a lot to gravity. A lot of people think, well, that's just what holds you to the ground. It is. But there's a lot more to it than that. It's not difficult, at least that what we know about it. There are some things we don't know about gravity. We don't know what's causing it yet. Let's review what we already know about gravity. Gravity is a force. A force is any push or pull. Every object exerts a gravitational force pulling all other objects towards the center of its mass. In example, we are all pulled in towards the center of the Earth. This is why the ground is down, even at the South Pole. But we do know quite a bit about it. And it is the reason the universe exists. The universe would not have existed. We'll say the Big Bang actually happened. And what would have happened after that without gravity? Well, subatomic particles would have just dispersed across this area. And that would have been it. Wouldn't even formed an atom, except maybe by random chance here and there you might have formed hydrogen, but nothing bigger than hydrogen. So, we're going to look at the universe. Now, what would the universe be made out of? I know you've studied all kinds of things and you know everything is made out of atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons. You've heard this. But, those are the things in the universe. The universe itself. What's that? Well, there was a scientist and a teacher, he was a really good teacher, who did try to explain to his students about this. You might have heard about him. His name was Albert Einstein. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, he was a teacher as well as a scientist, and when he was teaching his students about the discoveries of another scientist you probably heard of, Sir Isaac Newton, the fig cookie guy. Yeah, no, he didn't invent fig cookies. He's a guy that sat under a tree and had an apple hit him in the head. But he is known for discovering what is called the theory of universal gravitation. And we'll get into what that means, calling it the theory of gravity. Yes, gravity is a scientific theory. But when Einstein was explaining this to his students, he talked about on a scale of the entire universe. So... He says, first of all, let's just assume the universe is real. Yeah, there is really a universe. So what's it made out of? And once again, we said matter in the universe is made out of atoms. But the universe itself, what Einstein said is that the universe is made out of space and time. He called it the space-time continuum. And this is going to be our space-time continuum. And the space-time continuum goes on seemingly forever. And it's just space and time. Empty space and time. Now, if you put an object into the universe, and it doesn't matter what that object is. If we have an empty universe, you can put any object into it. You can call it the singularity from before the Big Bang. You can call it a galaxy. A galaxy. A star, a planet, a moon, a single proton, a softball. Doesn't matter. It's just an object in an otherwise empty universe. So here we're going to put an object in the universe. And as you can see here, 
the universe is bent inwards around it. This is a distortion in space-time, and all objects do that. We can actually see it in real life if you watch a star on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy through a big telescope pass behind the, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way to us. And it's just like this experiment they do with babies called object permanency. It's this little experiment. They do it with babies to see if their brain is developing right. You get this little blinder, and then the doctor has a little bunny puppet. Bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny... And the little baby's already looking over here for the bunny puppet to come out, and that means the baby's thinking right. If you're going, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, bunny puppet, and the bunny puppet doesn't come out, the baby starts going... trying to figure out why the bunny puppet didn't come out. Well, kind of the opposite is what happens with a star that goes behind the black hole. Let me grab my ball again so I can show you. You see the star moving along, and as it gets close, because of that distortion of space-time, it speeds up and comes out, and then slows down again. The star is not speeding up. What you're seeing is light being bent around this fold in the space-time continuum. That's gravity. That's what it is. If this was a, a live in-person lesson, I have plenty of these for everybody. And for the teachers wondering about in this day of plagues, well, how do you clean this? Well, I mean, I can spray it with Lysol if I have to do two classes, three classes in the same day, but then, and it goes right in the washer. Okay, so if we take our singular object and place it into an otherwise empty universe, you can see that space and time folds inwards around it. And if you could see time as a direction, the same way that you see say, distance, which it is. I mean, we measure time just like we measure distance. We measure distance in inches, feet, miles, light years, whatever. We measure time in seconds, minutes, hours, centuries. It's just a direction. It can be measured, but if we could actually see back and forward in time, which we can't, and we were to look at an object in an empty universe, you would see the universe bending inwards through time towards that object. Space is a distance that we can measure, no matter how far away you are. Time, time works the, time same, works the way. same way. So if we put a second object in the universe, a smaller object, it'll move inwards through space and time until it hits that object. That's gravity. That's why you're not leaving the Earth. It's simple as that. Now, why then doesn't every object in the universe, like, say, why doesn't the moon crash into the Earth, the Earth crash into the sun? That gets into Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion will stay in motion. Newton's first law of motion. An object at rest will stay at rest. And an object in motion will stay in motion traveling at a constant speed in a straight line unless an outside force acts on it. What Isaac Newton said is that if you are moving past an object in a straight line at the exact same speed that gravity is pulling you inwards, that you're moving downwards through space and time towards that object, you'll fall all the way around that object and come right back to where you started. That's what orbit is. There's an object in orbit around another object. I'm tilting this slightly to make it roll downhill towards or away from me at the same speed it's moving downhill towards this softball. And it keeps going around and around. But you'll notice it's not a perfect circle. It's more of an ellipse. Planetary orbits are an ellipse. No matter how perfect I am, this will always be slightly egg-shaped. And that gets into some math that we'll get into over the next, I don't know, couple weeks a little bit. Speed of gravity, things like that.
We might do some pendulum activities just so that we can kind of get a real handle on gravity because I'm going to keep coming back to this all year long. With the exception of our life science unit, everything we're going to cover, we're going to come right back to this. So that's why I felt it was a great place to start. And I did mention that if you had two objects that were closer to the same size, they would move towards each other, not one doing all the moving like a softball and a ball bearing. Here I got a ball bearing and a marble. And they'll kind of both go in towards the center, towards each other. Okay, so now we are up to the laboratory instructions themselves. This is the first time we've done a lab together. So you're going to be learning how I do things. And the first thing to understand is, while I may joke around about a lot of things, lab safety is never going to be one of those. I am absolutely serious about lab safety. You can either follow my laboratory instructions or you just won't participate. I can't have anybody getting hurt. So... For this lab, we don't have huge safety, there's nothing major, but I am going to expect you to wear, the entire time, safety goggles. Now, some of you have probably noticed that when I did the activity myself to demonstrate it, I was not wearing safety goggles, and you're calling me a hypocrite already. Well, no. I am one adult who has done this many, many times, all by myself in a room. You're going to be a whole room full of kids who have never done this before. Now, while I don't expect this to be a problem, I am sure at some point somebody will have a marble leave the surface of their gravity hoop. And just in case you're bending over to pick yours up while somebody else's rolls off the edge, I just, you know, eye protection. I don't... yeah, that's always going to be a thing. So, the next thing you'll need, obviously, is going to be your gravity hoop. Softball. And I'm going to give you a marble. Now, the trick is, now, if this is a regular school year, you'll be working in a partner. If this is still the corona times, you will be working by yourself and classes will be much smaller. At least that's what they have been telling me so far. So, the idea is first, get your marble so that you can get it to orbit the softball. And with two people, you're standing on opposite sides and you're working together. And that takes a little bit of practice, too, to work together. So you want to get that to orbit. Once you can do that, see how many times you can get it to orbit. See if you can get it to stable orbit and count how many times before it either crashes or goes off the edge. That's step one. Step two, once you can get it so you can consistently get it to go around, see if you can get it to go around closer to the softball, and further away. What's different in what you have to do to have it orbit up close versus orbit far away? That's all information that you'll need to record on your lab sheet. And then when you're done, you return your materials, finish your lab sheet, turn that into me. I will get that right back to you as quickly as I can because you're going to use that information to develop your very first lab report for me. Now, the first lab report is going to be kind of fill in the blank because I want you to learn how to write a lab report. That's one of my big goals for you this year is that by the end of the year, you'll be able to write a solid high school level lab report. So we're going to begin on that already with the very first lab. This is a simple lab. Kids have had a lot of fun. I've been doing this for years with kids. They have a lot of fun with this one, and it doesn't take long. So with that, Hope I see you soon. Hope you have fun. And for those folks, because this is for a job interview, hope I get the job. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.